namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Okay, we will continue now with the study of the Satipatthana Sutta. This is Sutta number 10 in the Majjhima Nikaya. <clears throat> and last time we spoke about the meditation on the four great elements. We're on page 148 in the book. We spoke about the meditation on the four great elements. That's number five in contemplation of the body. And now we come to the meditation six to fourteen. These are actually nine meditations, which are really all part of one group, which are called <laughs> the nine charnel ground contemplations. And these, you'll, if you've read the sutta, you'll notice that these are developed with, you might call, loving attention to detail. <laughs> it's rather difficult to practice these or to obtain a visual impression of the objects of these meditation nowadays because we don't have the opportunity to see bodies in these stages of decay. But in ancient India, <clears throat> it was common to take the bodies of criminals who had been executed, people who had, homeless people who had died accidentally or from illnesses, and just <clears throat> cast their bodies off into the, what they call the susana, the charnel ground and leave them to decay, and then the bodies will be attacked by various predators, animals, birds of prey. And so monks and also nuns who wanted to practice these meditations would just go off to the charnel ground and just try to find a suitable a corpse and suitable stage of decay, spend a couple of, you know, maybe an hour or so contemplating it, getting a firm visual impression of it, and then using that as a theme for repeated contemplation. But we have, I think the <laughs> Buddha was quite considerate of us, because in the sutta, he uses an expression. In Pali, he goes, Puna chaparang bhikave bhikkhu seyatapi. The word seyatapi, this expression is used to introduce, sometimes to introduce a simile. It means just as if such and such were to take place. So it seems to be implied here, we might translate this a little differently again because just as if one were to see a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground. So the implication is that one doesn't have to literally see the corpse in the state, state of decay. But if one doesn't have this opportunity, one can use one's imagination to conceive of a corpse in the state of decay. And whether one, you, of course, if one has the opportunity to see the corpse in that state of decay, 
it's a much more powerful object. But if one has a vivid imagination, then one can just use one's imagination. But when has to, when one use, uses the imagination, whether one uses an actual object or the imagination, one has to handle this particular meditation subject very skillfully. Otherwise, if one doesn't, it can cause one to become frightened, panicky, tormented by... If one goes, if one is meditating in a remote hut someplace, (laughs) one will start maybe having visions of the corpse one is seeing in the cremation ground. Now the shadow is appearing on the wall when there's a full moon. and Oh, it's come to get me, come to get me. (laughs) Or when if one has vivid dreams, one falls asleep and... The corpse is coming, like um, Dracula or Frankenstein. So one has to handle this meditation very, very skillfully. And I think it's not a meditation to begin with, or not to use until one really has very, very... has achieved some degree of mastery or experience using more basic meditation subjects, like the mindfulness of breathing or the walking meditation or the meditation on the four elements. But this meditation is an extremely powerful subject to use if one uses it, I would say, sparingly and skillfully for well, for several purposes. One purpose that's used by monastics is to help overcome sensuality since one becomes attached to bodies, the bodies of others, when one sees them alive, but when one sees a body that's dead, then it loses its sensual appeal and one realizes that all bodies have the same nature. Also, the theme, the constant theme, in fact, the main point of this meditation, which is emphasized in each of the contemplations comes with this line. Okay, one see, we'll just take the first contemplation for consideration. One sees as though one were to see a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, one, two, or three days dead, bloated, livid, and oozing matter. Then this is the main point. A monk compares this same body, that is one's own body, with that body thus. This body too, that is one's own body, is of the same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that, from that fate. Ayam piko kayo evang damo evang bave etam anatito anatitoti. So, This reflection reminds us that this body that we identify with, taking it to be mine, that we cling to, that we relish and enjoy, this body will also be like that. Someday this body is going to expire. Life force will be extinguished. It will be dead. And, well, nowadays, when people die, they don't throw the body away in a charnel ground, but they put on nice makeup, put on a new suit of clothes, <laughs> they put it in the funeral parlor. I think the funeral parlor, they put up a nice um, smile. The morticians, they put up a nice smile on the face. So it looks almost like a person has gone into a deep, peaceful sleep, and just if you wait a couple of days, then Uncle Fred is going to wake up and be back with us again, laughing, smiling, joking, eating, and doing all of the things that he did in the past. So we don't get the impression that the body is, is really dead. But when one sees it lying like, like that, in the state of decay, then one considers one's own body will be in such a condition too. 
then that helps to remove this attachment to one's own body and the delusion that through which we hold to this body as being I, mine, myself. Even though this, the sutta treats these nine channel ground contemplations as being separate contemplations, I like to see them as forming a sequence because that's how you get the most, in my view, the most powerful message out of this series by seeing them as describing a sequence so that one goes from the body after it's one, two, or three days dead, then the next stage you have the body This is in paragraph 16. It's being devoured by the animals, the birds of prey, crows, hawks, vultures, by animals, predators, cows. I'm sorry, not cows. How did I get cows? Dogs, jackals, and various kinds of worms. Again, one sees the body being devoured by those creatures, and one also then one thinks, my body too is going to be devoured by creatures like that. This body is food. Then one goes to the next stage, when the body is lo- what's left of the body, the skeleton, with some flesh and blood on it held together with sinews, then all of the flesh has been eaten away, decayed. There's just the skeleton, still smeared with blood, held together with sinews. Then there's the skeleton, no more flesh and blood, just the plain skeleton, held together with with, with sinews. Then the next stage, I guess the sinews have decayed and maybe some animals have pulled the bones away so now the bones are scattered in different directions so that even the impression of there being a skeleton is now vanished and it's just bones, different bones here and there. Okay, then jumping down to 26, Now one sees the corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground. Bones, they're bleached white, the color of shells. Just the bones, the color of shells. Now, there was a mistake. Yeah, then the bones heaped up. Then bones, I think that goes, then the next one is actually bones more than a year old, rotted and crumbled to dust. And so now the bones themselves are just crumbled to dust. So out of this whole body, there's nothing left but dust. I like to take it one step further where the wind has blown the dust of the bones away or the dust of the bones has settled into the earth so that it's not even distinguishable anymore as the dust of bones, but it's just become part of the earth. And so now the complete empty nature of the body becomes manifest. Like there's now nothing there anymore. Maybe the easiest way to get this is with cremation. You have it all takes place instead of having to extend over a period of a year, just in a few hours you have the whole body put into the fire, exposed to the heat, then the next day go to the site of the cremation and all that's left is you see some bones left, pieces of bone, a lot of ashes, and that's all that was there of the person. Where is the person gone? (laughs) 
Okay, and in each case, when one does this reflection, one applies it to one's own body thus. This body is of the same nature. It will be like that. It has not, it is not exempt from that fate. It has not escaped from that destiny. Okay, so in this way, the Buddha goes on, one abides contemplating the body as a body internally with regard to one's own body. One abides contemplating the body as a body externally. One could apply the same idea to the bodies of others. Actually, one sees that all those who are alive now are subject to the same fate, the same destiny. Or one abides contemplating the body as a body both internally and externally. One takes one's own body, the bodies of others who are alive now, and one pl- applies to them the same thought that they are of the same nature as that corpse in some state of de- deterioration. They are not exempt from that fate. then actually as one goes on contemplating in this way, since one is doing this in a framework, call this in a framework of total mindfulness and clear comprehension, eventually we will build up what I would call the force of mindfulness and clear awareness so that one could just then focus upon this body itself and contemplate the nature of arising in this body the constant arising, origination of this body, and then the constant passing away or vanishing, destruction of physical components within this body. And one abides contemplating in the body its nature of both arising and vanishing. That is, in succession, one contemplates both arising and passing away. Then one comes to the mindfulness, the awareness, there is a body simply established within oneself to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continued or sustained mindfulness. And thus one abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That too is how one dwells contemplating the body as a body. Okay, and with this we complete the contemplation of the body. That's the first section in the Satipatthana Sutta. So now at this point I'll ask whether there are any questions either on this section or on anything from the previous sections. Before we go further, Dr. Murray. I, I have uh, some simple questions that you may wish to uh, answer. Uh, uh, with respect to this contemplation, uh, one uh, that no longer clings to the body and uh, relish to it. Uh, sees that I am not that. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't take one uh, to the understanding that I am nothing at all, that there is no self. Yeah, at that point this is not brought in. This is not yet a complete... It's not yet setting out the complete course of insight. But now this is just, at this point, this is just What is just described here is the way of contemplating the body in order to see that this body is of the same nature as that one and that this body is not exempt from that faith, that this body will also undergo death and then decay. And so that helps to break the identification with the body. But this is the sutta is not yet setting out the whole course in, of, for the development of wisdom, but is setting out the method for establishing right mindfulness.
And we have to remember that right mindfulness is just one factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. And so it has to be, right mindfulness has to be integrated with right view or right understanding. And that will include the right view of insight, not simply the conceptual right view that one uses at the beginning of the path, but the right view of insight that arises when one applies this examination, investigation to all of the five aggregates, contemplating them all as impermanent, then from the impermanence of the five aggregates, one can come to the selfless nature of the five aggregates. One doesn't see, in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha doesn't bring in well, let's say the text of the Satipatthana Sutta doesn't bring in explicitly the contemplation of the three characteristics, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. But I would say that they are implied by the contemplation of arising and vanishing, arising and passing away. That is the doorway, the entranceway to the understanding of impermanence. Then from other suttas, one could understand impermanence as either the direct doorway to the understanding of non-self or else a little more indirect route, impermanence to unsatisfactoriness or suffering, then impermanence and suffering together leading into non-self. Any uh, further questions? David. Uh, yes, Monte. I, I understand why a monastic would uh, use contemplation uh, to try to become unattached and sensuousness. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is though, uh, I kind of have, like, I can understand that, but, but I kind of have, like, a very difficult time with looking at another person, say, as a body that's going to decay, and, yeah. you know, rather than use my perception, yeah. see that see that person is beautiful, which is really what I want to see, yeah. you know, and uh, I don't see that if I, that if I see it as uh, an impermanent, well, impermanent doesn't bother me, but something that's going to decay and get ugly and get... Hmm. You know, I don't see how that can really. I I just don't see how that could help um, make you feel better. <laughs> the object isn't really to help you feel better. <laughs> if you want to feel better, there are many many other ways to go about it. <laughs> but I'm saying, like you know, when you when you you're you're, you're living life and and you uh, you know it's impermanent and everything, but I mean, I, you like to enjoy. <laughs> I understand the impermanence about being unattached from impermanence. Yeah. Do that because that's difficult. When somebody dies, people have a lot of problems with that. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So I understand that. But yeah. It seems to be like a division for me, like a, like two different two 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 different sides of it that. I can understand, but I can't just lean towards one. It's also, I have to say, it's not a method of meditation that's to be used in an obsessive way. It's, I would call it a therapeutic meditation to be used for the specific purpose of helping to reduce and eventually to break that the attachments. Okay. In the beginning of the Sutta, uh, where the various objects of mindfulness are enumerated, uh, one contemplates feelings and feelings, uh, contemplates mind as mind, mind yeah. objects, mind objects, and one contemplates breath. Uh, can this be used to uh, bring the one with others? Exercises that one sits to perform separately or are used 
aspects of the awareness of which you had at all times. Is it, is it, are you talking how to how to come into the present moment? Are you talking about all four foundations of mindfulness? First, I would say to develop the foundations of mindfulness really requires taking up a particular attitude of mind so that it's difficult to maintain that attitude of mind in, let's say, continuously in the routines of daily life. So I would say the advice given within the sutta should be applied to the best of one's ability within the routine let's say the routine schedule of one's daily life. But to preserve this attitude of constant how is it described? Um, remaining ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and dejection towards the world. That is a very difficult attitude to sustain when one is involved in one's daily work activities, one's interpersonal relationships, ordinary leisure time enjoyments, and so on. And so it presupposes for constant development that one has withdrawn from active engagement in the ordinary activities of the world and that one is devoting time specifically to developing this particular framework of mind, this particular attitude of mind. Which is why, in order to practice the four foundations of mindfulness, people go on meditation retreats. Because it's only in the setting of a retreat that one can build up the momentum in order to understand how these four foundations of mindfulness are to be practiced consistently. But once one gains that experience, then one can have some knowledge of how to apply it within daily life. And particularly the advice on what's called clear comprehension or full awareness that gives some indications of how one is to apply mindfulness in daily living. And so one can, to some extent, try to apply mindfulness in everyday life. One way to do that is to have a daily meditation practice. So one has certain periods each day that one sets aside specifically for practicing one of these meditation exercises. Usually people will take something like mindfulness of breathing. And then through that practice, one builds up a certain momentum of inward observation, awareness of one. So even through mindfulness of breathing, which is initially a body contemplation, but through that practice, one learns to become aware of one's own, one's own feelings, one's own states of mind, and to recognize these states of mind in the course of one's daily life so that one knows how to, skill, how to deal with them skillfully in one's daily life so that one doesn't become victimized by them so often by the unwholesome states of mind. And so even in the little interactions of day-to-day life in moments of leisure in day-to-day life one knows how to turn the mind skillfully to one of these objects of mindfulness and use those little periods of the leisure, of non-engagement, in order to develop further one's mindfulness and attention to that primary meditation object. These are quite general questions. I just, I really want to invite questions that deal specifically with material that I've covered. 
Like anything just unclear in what I've covered so far? Okay, then shall we go on to the next major section? We now come to the second foundation of mindfulness or the object of mindfulness. This is the contemplation of feeling. We're in paragraph 32 now. How does a monk dwell contemplating feelings as feelings? Here, when feeling, when experiencing a pleasant feeling, a monk understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. When experiencing a painful feeling, he understands, I feel a painful feeling. When experiencing a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Okay, now we come back again. When feeling a worldly pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly pleasant feeling. When feeling an unworldly pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly pleasant feeling. When feeling a worldly painful feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly painful feeling. When feeling an unworldly painful feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly painful feeling. When feeling a worldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel a worldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When feeling an unworldly neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands, I feel an unworldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Okay, I said when I introduced the Satipatthana Sutta that our experience, the primary divisions of our experience are bodily experience, that's the kaya, and the mind, that's the citta. But in between the two, there is another domain of experience which is extremely important, and this is feeling. Feeling is a type of mental experience, but it's so important and so distinctive that the Buddha has placed it in a category of its own. And he makes it in the five aggregates. He has a separate aggregate called the aggregate of feeling. And in the foundations of mindfulness, the contemplations of mindfulness, there is a separate section, the contemplation of feeling. But now we have to understand what is meant here by feeling. In English, the word feeling often suggests emotions, but that is not what is meant by Vedana. Vedana is an important component of emotions, but emotions would be a very complex phenomenon. What is meant by feeling, I use the expression, it is the affective quality of experience. That is the quality of experience that we, the way we experience things in terms of being either pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful. That is neutral feeling. And the reason why the Buddha gives so much attention to feeling is because feeling is, we can call it like the trigger, which sets off many more complex levels of experience. That it is pleasant feeling that becomes the trigger for craving 
and attachment. And so within the formula of dependent origination, the 12 factored formula of dependent origination, the Buddha says that conditioned by feeling, craving arises. That is specifically, usually it is pleasant feeling, enjoyable feelings that set off, that originate craving. Because one craves for pleasant feelings. Then painful feeling when unexamined, not treated with mindfulness, becomes a trigger which sets off aversion, dislike, hatred, anger, irritation, annoyance. And neutral feeling, feeling that's neither pleasant nor painful, is a trigger that sustains a state of dull equanimity, dull indifference, apathy, this kind of complacent settling into the, to a complacent acceptance of the present without any sense of inspiration, without any urge to change, to develop oneself. And so if we allow feelings to arise within our mental life and don't observe them with mindfulness, then the feeling becomes a catalyst which sets off these other mental processes, either states of attachment and craving, states of aversion, annoyance, irritation, or dull indifference, complacency. And therefore, the Buddha has taken feeling and put it into a separate category and made it a separate domain of contemplation. And by treating feeling as an object of mindfulness, on the one hand, we're able to prevent feeling from setting off these unwholesome mental processes. And we're also able to penetrate deeply and understand the conditioned nature of our experience because we can see how feelings arise and how the mind tends to react to them, to respond to them. And then by observing, continuing to observe feeling, one can gain deep insight into the nature of experience itself. Then feeling tends to come into, I call, become prominent within the meditative process at some point after one has begun practicing with the body as a primary object of meditation. Of course, there are many, med- I should say that the sutta, the foundations of mindfulness, it sets up a framework within which one could devise hundreds of different systems of meditation. There are many, many different methods or systems of meditation which are rooted within the sutta, the foundations of mindfulness, using different techniques. So there will be some meditation teachers who use mindfulness of the body as the primary meditation object or one of the exercises in mindfulness of the body. And then they will bring in mindfulness of feeling, contemplation of mind later as additions to the contemplation of the body. There'll be other meditation teachers who begin or 
introduced contemplation of feeling at a very early point and make that a primary object of contemplation. One of the most famous, of course, is Goenka and teaches in his tradition. <clears throat> and so what will be happen usually when one is beginning to practice meditation intensively using one of the body objects of mindfulness. For example, mindfulness of breathing or it could be the rising and falling of the abdomen. After some point, one will notice pains begin to appear in the body and pains become more and more prominent. So if one doesn't pay attention to the pain, then the pain will become a distraction, a disturbance, even a cause of discouragement. So one has to know in order to be able to get through the painful phase of the meditation practice, one has to be able to know how to utilize this phase of painful experience and yoke it to the practice so that instead of becoming an obstacle, it actually becomes an aid or an intensifying factor that assists the development of the meditation. And so what one will do as one is, say, contemplating the rising and falling of the abdomen or the in and out breathing, as one notices pain in the legs or pain in the back, at first one will just mindfully note the pain, painful feeling, painful feeling. If there is some dejection in the mind because of the pains, that is also a painful feeling, a painful mental feeling. One will notice dejection and just treat that purely as a mental feeling and then bring the mind back to the main object, in and out breathing, rise and fall of the abdomen. But if the pain continues to be very persistent and very domineering in the field of attention to the point where one can no longer focus on the primary object, then one might just put aside the original object, the breath, the rising and falling of the abdomen, and turn the attention instead to the painful feeling and just treat the painful feeling as the object of mindful contemplation. And as one observes the painful feeling, one will start to notice that the, what one calls the painful feeling turns out to be not a solid, massive whole, something which is persisting in time as one discrete entity. But as one is observing it continuously, it turns into a flow or process of, or it seems to turn into a flow of painful feeling. But as one attends more and more closely to this apparent flow of painful feeling, that in turn breaks up into a sequence, a series of discrete moments, you might call them flashing moments, of momentary painful feelings, each one distinct from its predecessor and the following feeling. So there's just flashing moments of painful feeling arising, stopping, arising, stopping, arising, stopping, but occurring very, very quickly. And so as one is observing them, one is seeing within the painful feeling the truth of impermanence becoming manifest. Even though it seems like the pain is the most permanent, <laughs> could be seem like the most permanent thing in the world. <laughs> but, <laughs> but 
the pain itself that one conceptualizes as pain turns out in actuality to be a series of just moments of painful feeling. And as the attention, the capacity for attention focuses more and more finely upon that experience of painful feeling, even those flashing occasions of painful feeling will in turn break down into more discreet little packets of painful feeling until, again, what seems to be the painful feeling turns out to be a mental construct imposed upon the series of rapid flashes of painful feeling, just coming, going, coming, vanishing, coming, vanishing, arising, vanishing. And not only does the pain start changing its character from one whole block of pain first into a flowing current of pain, then into a series of flashing moments of pain. But as one tunes in to the precise nature of the pain, one sees how the pain has quite distinct character. There'll be different types of pain occurring in different ways. Sometimes, well, stabbing pain, sometimes throbbing pain, sometimes flashing pain, aching pain, oppressive pain, cutting pain. But one can use these labels just as a way to observe the pain. And as one is observing it, turning it into an object, It ceases to be something that oppresses and torments one. But it becomes an interesting object of observation, just like looking at a distant planet through a telescope or maybe some species of cell, some species of microscopic animal life under a microscope. And so one examines all of the different flavors or textures of the painful feeling. And one notices that from moment to moment or from occasion to occasion, the textures, the flavor of the painful feeling will change. That also brings into the field of awareness the characteristic of impermanence. And then if one persists after some time, the painful feeling itself will stop and the body again settles into the new posture and the mind can go back to the primary object. When this happens and the mind becomes strongly concentrated, then there will arise feelings of pleasure, pleasant feeling. And then that, if it's allowed to go unexamined, can become again a danger in itself that one gets carried away by the pleasant feeling, rapture, bliss, joy. And then one tries to hold on to it, to cling to it. And when that happens, then one has become, again, a victim of craving or attachment, but this time to a spiritual pleasure. In fact, when one tries to hold on to that pleasure, that causes the pleasure to diminish, to decrease. And so one has to note when pleasant feeling arises, one just notes it as pleasant feeling and lets go of it. Now the sutta and other texts distinguish within these three main types of feeling two subdivisions of each. In Pali, these are called sa-misang-vedanang 
and near Amisang Vedana. The word Amisang means something like, literally it's like flesh or meat. And so Samisang Vedana is what I would translate as carnal feeling or worldly feeling. And so there can be a worldly, pleasant feeling. That would be a pleasant feeling which is in some way connected with sensual enjoyment. A worldly, painful feeling would be a painful feeling that arises from a failure to obtain some object, some worldly object that one wants. And then the neutral worldly feeling, that would be this feeling, this neutral feeling of dull indifference. This feeling neither pleasant nor painful, but just kind of dull settling back. Apathy, indifference, complacency, a kind of feeling accompanied by a sense of complacent acceptance of the status quo. The opposite of this is the unworldly feeling or spiritual feelings. Okay, we have a spiritual pleasant feeling. This is the pleasant feeling that arises For example, when the mind starts to become concentrated, focused well upon its object. Or it's the pleasant feeling that might accompany a person of a devotional temperament when they come into a Buddhist temple, they might see a beautiful statue of the Buddha, then they might do vandana, they might bow down to the Buddha image, then the mind gets uplifted with joy and happiness. That's a spiritual pleasant feeling. Or when one is practicing loving kindness, then the mind radiates with joy and happiness. Or people who have a generous temperament when they're able to give gifts, to practice giving, then they experience joy and happiness. So this is a wholesome type of happiness, wholesome type of pleasure, which is a good type of pleasure, the type of pleasure that should be cultivated. And similarly, painful feeling also has this twofold distinction. There is the worldly painful feeling, the painful feeling when one fails to get what one desires, But there's also a spiritual painful feeling. That is a painful feeling, say, when one is aspiring to higher states of consciousness. One is making a real serious, sincere effort, but one is not attaining the object of one's aspirations. Then one feels some urge, some yearning, some longing to reach these higher states. And it causes some pain within oneself that one hasn't reached them. And so even though technically, from looking at this from an Abhidhamma point of view, that kind of painful feeling would have to be classified as unwholesome, but this is from a spiritual point of view, it's still a valuable type of painful feeling. Of course, this is what motivates one to perform wholesome deeds or to continue one's practice in order to reach the object of one's aspiration. Or also, sometimes if one considers one's actions in the past, say before one met the Buddha Dhamma, we might have behaved foolishly. Then one thinks, oh, how could have I done such foolish, unwholesome deeds? Then one feels some kind of pain in the mind, unhappiness. We call um, vipatisara in Pali, regret, or maybe chan wei in Chinese, 
sense of remorse, repentance. So, this feeling, it's a painful feeling, but it's a good type of painful feeling because it motivates one to change oneself and to one sees the benefits that come from developing wholesome qualities, from eliminating unwholesome qualities. And so one is motivated to continue along that practice. The feeling that's neither pleasant nor painful, this is very subtle because this is a very tricky area because this type of feeling, it's very subtle, not so easy to notice the neutral feeling. And so, in our day-to-day life, we experience this neutral feeling many, many times. But if we're not mindful of it, not aware of it, easily we easily just settle back with this complacent acceptance of the status quo, not wishing to change ourselves, not wishing to change the things around us for the better. And if one attains the wholesome type of neutral feeling, the state of inner equanimity, but one doesn't recognize it as such, then one could develop a subtle attachment to that equanimity. Not recognizing that even that neutral feeling is impermanent. One very important aspect about the Buddha's teaching, where the Buddha differs from the ascetics that were his contemporaries, is that the Buddha, you see, the, the contemporaries of the Buddha thought that pleasant feeling should always be avoided, that the way to liberation, the way to enlightenment, lies through painful feeling. But the Buddha made this distinction between two types of pleasant feeling, two types of painful feeling, the worldly and the unworldly, both pleasant feeling and painful feeling have that twofold division. And he taught that the worldly pleasant feeling and the worldly painful feeling, as well as the worldly neutral feeling, those feelings have to be overcome. But the spiritual pleasant feeling, even the spiritual painful feeling and the spiritual neutral feeling, those feelings are beneficial and wholesome. Ideally, we have to overcome even the spiritual painful feeling since we don't like painful feeling. But we can use the spiritual painful feeling as a spur for self-cultivation. When we do so, then we arouse the spiritual pleasant feeling. And then that spiritual pleasant feeling, when it becomes mature and well-established, leads into the spiritual peaceful feeling. That's the feeling that's neither painful nor pleasant, the feeling of equanimity. Okay, so the practitioner here, the, the monk that's being described in the sutta, whenever one feels one of these feelings, one recognizes that one is feeling that feeling. If one is using the body as a main object of meditation, one would not start turning to the feelings whenever one is feeling one of these feelings, because one is always experiencing one feeling or another. But whenever one of these feelings becomes prominent, then and impinges upon the on the field of awareness, then one would turn one's attention to that feeling and take note of it, then bring the mind back 
to the primary object, the bodily object. But if that feeling becomes very prominent, then one can turn one's attention full force onto the feeling itself and make that an object of observation. But there are certain systems of meditation which use a bodily contemplation like mindfulness of breathing just as a way to settle the mind. Then once the mind becomes settled, then one is instructed to go into full contemplation of the feelings, particularly using bodily sensation as the main object of of awareness. And so in this way, now we come to the insight portion, page, uh, paragraph 33. In this way, he dwells contemplating feelings as feelings internally, or he dwells contemplating feelings as feelings externally, or he dwells contemplating feelings as feelings both internally and externally. Now, this paragraph raises interesting question. How does one dwell contemplating feelings as feelings externally? (laughs) Excluding the rare case, very rare case of, well, I don't even know if somebody who can read the mind of another, whether they can actually experience the feelings of another. I don't know if that's possible. Unless one has very extraordinary capacity of reading the minds of another. But let us say, I mean, that's a very rare exception, even a person who has that ability, but ordinary practitioners, and this advice is given for ordinary practitioners, how does one contemplate the feelings as feelings externally, contemplating feelings of others? Yeah, I think that's the only way that it could be done. It's just to consider that I myself am not the only one who's experiencing these feelings, but all other, because thought with human beings, are also experiencing pleasant, painful, neutral feelings. (laughs) Well, if you're at a doing a silent meditation course and it's and there's a monitor or teacher saying I told you not to talk <laughs> you're not supposed to talk I think one could get some intuitive sense of the way other people are feeling, sometimes from the way they're carrying the body, facial expressions. Sometimes if one becomes very sensitive, just one could almost feel another person's mood. But I think it's not really necessary to get so specific to be practicing this contemplation. The way I understand it is just simply that one understands that other people and broadening it from other human beings to animals are also experiencing pleasant, painful, neutral feelings. In fact, what's remarkable, very remarkable thing sometimes that I, I think, sometimes one sees a little living creature about the size of a speck of dust Sometimes it might be crawling on one's hand or you see it crawling on a little leaf. And for, when you first look at it, it looks just like a speck of dust, a little speck of dirt. But then when you look again, it's moving or crawling. And you consider that this little creature, it's 
reflecting the whole universe is being reflected by that creature. <laughs> it's as a mind which is mirroring the entire universe, just like our own mind is. <laughs> Yet, when you look at it, it looks just like a speck of dust. <laughs> and so you could think so many creatures, millions and millions of creatures, doing the same thing. <laughs> okay, so then one considers others having the feelings, then one goes back and forth, this is contemplating the feelings, as feelings both internally and externally. One goes, alternates quickly back and forth. One is experiencing feelings, others experiencing feelings, oneself, others, oneself, others, till one has, you call it an alternating current of experiencing feelings. Then one abides contemplating and feelings their nature of arising or one abides contemplating and feelings their nature of vanishing, or one abides contemplating and feelings their nature of both arising and vanishing. This is what I indicated earlier, a few minutes ago, when I was speaking about as one is observing the feelings and paying very close attention to them, one will see how feelings are constantly, at each moment, coming into being, and passing away, coming into being and passing away. And though one will we'll start off by, one might start off observing just specific feelings, maybe feelings that arise in the knees, the buttocks, arms, the back. But when the mind becomes very sensitive, one can then extend that awareness globally over the whole body, scanning the body from the top of the head right down to the soles of the feet, and experiencing feelings in every part of the body, the subtlest parts of the body, even the back of the earlobes, the inside of the toes. <laughs> there are feelings in every part of the body constantly that we're not aware of because the mind is not sensitive enough to feel them. But when the mind becomes very sensitive, one could put one's attention into these areas, that hidden areas, and one will feel a mass of feeling in those areas arising and passing away. And so then one can take the body in globally as one whole, this mass, I call it like an atomic mass of feelings, always arising and passing away. Okay, and then at a certain point, one can even drop the distinguishing of feelings as pleasant, painful, neutral, stop observing the arising and vanishing, but one becomes simply mindful that there is feeling taking place simply to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and constant, repeated mindfulness. I think it's at this stage that one is simply aware of feeling as this impersonal phenomena. One is not identifying with the feeling, not taking the feeling to be I or mine, but aware simply that feeling is taking place. And in this way, one abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. And that is how a monk dwells contemplating feelings as feelings. Okay, now I'll ask again whether there's any, question, any questions. Dr. Murray. When, when you give the um, example of, of, of doing the light and uh, or the small creature, the size yeah. of the introduction, um, <laughs> you contemplate as concrete, part of concrete feeling externally. 
Um, well, we don't usually... I don't do that as an exercise in meditation. It was just something that occurs to me when I see a, a little creature that small. Uh, the, uh, if the whole universe is reflected in that light, that sounds to me like the notion of the, the magic window. Is, is that a uh, uh, original Buddhist notion? The idea of Indra's net, it's not explicitly developed within the Pali Suttas. The problem I have with that is the conceptual problem is uh, how the, a creature that doesn't have a nervous system to sustain feeling um, or reflect <coughs> part of the net. Say again. A creature that doesn't have a nervous system. I'm talking about a creature that does have a very primitive nervous system. I would assume that these little creatures do have some kind of nervous system. Yeah, I don't know how it is with plants. Though there were experiments, I don't know how whether they've been scientifically validated, but they, there was a book published in the 1970s called The Secret Life of Plants. We spoke about how somebody who had brought up plants, one set of plants, he would bring up playing sweet music, taking, speaking them very, speaking to them very pleasantly. He would give both sets of plants the same amount of water, the same nutrients, but one set of plants, he would play pleasant music, speak to them gently. The other set of plants, he didn't play any music, he spoke to them harshly. And the set of plants that he spoke to gently and played sweet music, they grew in a more healthy way and thrived more than the plants that he spoke to harshly and neglected. I only know the contents of the book by hearsay. I didn't read it myself. It makes sense to me. It doesn't mean that the plants have consciousness, but in some way they're sensitive to the way they're treated. Any further questions on the sutta? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Would he have that kind of feeling? Uh, so he didn't have those uh, yeah, five minutes or so, he shouldn't have the neutral feeling. The Arahant? He will have the neutral feeling. Yeah, but he will have... He won't have the... Car- he won't have the carnal neutral feeling, but he'll have the spiritual feel- neutral feeling. Because this will be the feeling the feeling that takes place, this is the feeling that occurs in states of equanimity. So, say in everyday life, when there's no occasion to be happy, joyful, just going about the everyday tasks, then his state of mind, the the feeling that accompanies his state of mind will usually be neutral feeling. Um... When he goes into, if he goes into the fourth jhana, the feeling in the fourth jhana is neutral feeling. In the three lower jhanas, it's pleasant feeling. I thought you were saying that feeling is, uh, is physical feeling, physical sensation and contact. So, not uh, well. There's so you know the Buddha had his, you know, his, his foot was injured. It was a painful feeling. Yes, the Buddha had. Is that the same feeling that we're talking about? In... Yeah, it's the same feeling. It's a neutral feeling. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
in the case of the Buddha getting the foot injured, it's a painful feeling. Um, I'm not sure what you mean this, in this conversation, saying that an hour would always feel neutral feeling. Did I say that he would only feel neutral? No. No, I, I said when he goes about his day-to-day activities, generally he'll feel neutral feelings, but he, he can f- feel painful feelings, painful bodily feelings. He will not feel... There are two types of painful feelings. Painful mental feelings. These are feelings that we can call states of sadness, sorrow, dejection. You know, sadness, sorrow, dejection. The Buddha, the Arhats, will not experience those feelings. But as long as they have a body with the sense faculties, they'll experience painful feeling that's inescapable as long as one has a body. They can stub the toe, they can get the Buddha got hit by that sharp rock. Um, Shaving, they can nick themselves and they'll experience pain. Experiences indirectly, and I mean, I know you don't experience it directly with pain, but they have to have some kind of an idea or some kind of perception that a person is in pain, or that they can see. If there's some kind of perception, don't they, that at some degree of like, like an idea of what? Of course, of course, that's yeah. yeah. It's impossible not to for them not to have that. In fact impossible for them not to have that idea. But wouldn't the idea by some way cause some kind of a pain? It arouses compassion, but they themselves do not feel dejection, sorrow, or sadness. But there's an empathy that comes with, that's the nature of compassion. So that they can feel, in a sense, Empathy with the sufferings of others. But sorrow for sorrow, sadness, dejection to occur within one's own mind, it requires like some adherence to idea of self, some nucleus of the sense of I around which that feeling can, can crystallize, congeal. Okay, we're going to have to stop now. It's getting late. So we do the dedication of the merit. Sharing the merit with the beings in the other realms. (coughs) Akasa ta chabuma ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakan to Sasanang Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakan to Desanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakan tu mang parang etavata chaham mehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe deva anumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Etavata Cha Amehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Bhutta Numodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Etavata Cha Amehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Sata 
Anumodantu Saba Sampati Sati